you. Order, would senators please take their positions? I have received through the Governor, uh, through the Governor General from the Governor of Victoria a facsimile copy of the Certificate of the Choice by the Houses of Parliament of Victoria of Mitchell Peter Fifield to fill the vacancy caused by the resignation of Senator Richard Alston. I table the document. Will the Honourable Senator please come to the table and make and subscribe the Oath of Allegiance? I, Mitchell Peter Fifield, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, according to law. So help me God. Please now sign the test roll and the senator's roll. Questions. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Patterson as Minister for Family and Community Services. Order. Is she here? Order. Now we're going to start our que last question time for this session with this, that sort of noise. I won't, I'm, I'm not going to accept it today. We'll just have some peace and quiet. Order. Well, here was I suppose. Senator Jones. Uh, Senator Collins. <laughs> Order. <laughs> Note. Does the minister recall the leaked cabinet minute of the 17th of December 2002? which stated, Cabinet had noted, and I quote, that pressures remain on families in transition to parenthood, including a particularly sharp fall in income against which families receive varying levels of government assistance. Why has the government still not acted on this 2002 Cabinet Minute note, which recommended improving financial assistance at the time of birth of a child? Will the government now deliver on its three-year-old promise to help families balance their work and family responsibilities by developing an alternative policy which would deliver timely assistance at the birth of a child? Senator Patterson. Much, Mr. President. Well, it gives me the opportunity to remind honourable senators and to remind the community about what we have done for families in assisting them to balance work and family. What we have done is give families $19 billion a year assistance, $19 billion a year assistance 
almost $2 billion a year more in family assistance since the introduction of the new family tax system. What we've also done is to give families assistance, particularly where one, one member of the family chooses to stay at home, through the Family Tax Benefit B, almost $2,900 for each child under five. We've also given families assistance with childcare, doubling the amount of funding that's been spent on childcare since we came into government, from, eight, from $4 billion to $8 billion. Senator Collins doesn't want to hear this, uh, but uh, she's going to have to listen to the fact, because she doesn't like to hear that we have actually doubled spending on childcare. We've increased the number of childcare places by 210,000, from now up to 530,000 childcare places. We have assisted families also. Order. We have also assisted families to balance work and family by introducing much more flexible workplaces to enable families to mix work and family. Labor, Labor is so inflexible with their slavery to unions that actually means that families don't have the opportunity to have workplaces that are flexible, workplaces that deal with balancing their work and family. Unlike uh, Labor, who fails, it has always failed to cost and fund their policies, and when they are in government, racked up $60 billion worth of debt, on which we were paying almost $5 billion a year in interest. And you'd think they'd learn that when you borrow money, you have to pay interest. $5 billion in interest. That is money we can now spend assisting families through the Stronger Families and Community Program, assisting families in, in ways that will assist them to actually uh, care for their families. But Labor didn't care. They borrowed from the next generation of children. They didn't build for the future. Senator Collins shrugs her shoulders and closes her eyes because she doesn't want to hear that we've actually assisted families and increased assistance to families by uh, $2 billion a year, or almost $2 billion a year, since the introduction of the new family tax system, doubled spending on childcare, increased the number of childcare places by 210,000, increased flexibility in the workplace so to assist families to balance work and family. Senator Collins, supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Is the minister aware that there are no budget papers? or portfolio statements in existence that can verify the Treasurer's extraordinary claim that the baby bonus spending has been revised down by $347 million in the forward estimates. Has the government hidden these budget numbers because there is a secret plan to scrap the baby bonus, or is it just that Mr Costello can't admit that a policy that he once described as the centrepiece of the government's election platform was a massive flop. Senator Patterson. Sir, Mr. President, I always say that as soon as Labor hasn't got a policy or has got a policy that's got a problem and their child care payment policy has got a problem, they concoct a conspiracy. That's typically all scaremonger. One or the other concoct a uh, conspiracy or scaremonger. What you ought to be worried about, Senator Collins, is that you've got, you've got uh, role because you've had your side going out all the time talking about a paid maternity leave scheme and it's gone off the agenda. Where is the Labor Party's paid maternity scheme? What they have done is surreptitiously get rid of that, surreptitiously get rid of that and substitute this uh, baby care payment which is not fully funded. Senator Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate and, Senate and Minister for Defence, Senator Hill. And I ask, is the Minister aware of claims today by the Opposition Leader that the immediate withdrawal of Australian troops from Iraq would have no consequences? Will the Minister outline the consequences that such a reckless action would have for Australian diplomats and officials in Iraq and for the people of Iraq? And I further ask, is the, is the Minister aware of any information provided by the Defence Department officials which may have led the opposition leader to have made such a foolish remark. Thanks, Senator, Senator Ferguson. And, um, let me answer the last question first. There have been no operational briefings on Iraq to Mr Latham from defence officials. None, Mr President. In fact, as far as our records show, Mr Latham has never even asked for an operational briefing on Iraq let alone received one. 
Mr. President, in light of that, Mr. Latham's verbaling of Mr. Benighton yesterday was disgraceful. Following a request made through the Prime Minister's office, my office arranged for Mr. Latham to receive the standard briefing that all new opposition leaders receive on the general roles and responsibilities of DSD and Pine Gap. That briefing was done by Mr. Benighton, a senior and respected public servant. Mr. Benighton gave the briefing and, on returning to Canberra, wrote and signed a note outlining the areas which were covered in detail in the briefing. Mr. President, not surprisingly, they were the areas which are covered in all such standard briefings. Current operations in Iraq were not mentioned in that note. Mr. President, this is not a politically convenient reconstruction done months later. It was written and signed while the meeting was still fresh in Mr. Benighton's mind. Mr. President, the Prime Minister has offered to show Mr. Latham that note. Not surprisingly, Mr. Latham has not taken up the offer. In contrast to Mr. Benighton's recollection of the briefing, which was backed up by the contemporaneous note, we have an opposition leader making wild, unsubstantiated claims. In doing so, he was he what he basically said was that Mr. Benighton briefed against the government of the day. Shocking allegations against a highly respected and professional public servant. And I might say in passing, Mr. President, a public servant that still has the full confidence of this government. This was an invention by Mr. Latham for his short term political objective of trying to get himself out of the mess he had created. And we know that he couldn't have been briefed on operational matters. If he had, how could he have made the statement this morning? that the immediate withdrawal of troops would have no consequences. Mr President, the immediate withdrawal of our troops would leave Australian diplomats, Australian officials and Australian businessmen Order. completely without protection. The immediate Order. withdrawal of our troops would leave the new Iraqi army short of professional trainers. The immediate withdrawal of Australian Senator troops Camp and Senator would punch Evans. holes in the provisional authority, the coalition headquarters in Baghdad and the United headquarters, the UN headquarters, UK headquarters in Basra. Mr. President, Mr. Latham told the Parliament yesterday that he relies on Senator Evans for getting regular updates on defence. Last week it was Mr. Beasley. I've been advised by Defence that, according to their records, the last operational briefings given to Senator Evans on Iraq by the head of strategic operations was on April 14, 2003, almost 12 months ago. Mr. President, Mr. Latham told the parliament he relies on Mr. Rudd because Mr. Rudd's travelled to Baghdad and he's been briefed there. The only problem with that is that after those briefings, Mr. Rudd didn't call for an immediate withdrawal of the troops. He called for more military trainers to go to Iraq. He called for police trainers to go to Iraq. He called for election commission workers to go to Iraq. Mr. President, Order. today the government is announcing the appointment of Major General Jim Molan as the, as the uh, Deputy Chief for Operations within the Multilateral Force headquarters in Baghdad to be established as part of the transition to Iraqi Order. governance. Order, I congratulate him, Mr. Time, President. Time it's for an answering important the question position. has expired. Senator Ferguson. Yes, yeah, supplementary question, Mr. President. Uh, could I ask the minister uh, to inform the Senate of the new, any further new contributions that the ADF is making in Iraq, and how would an ill-conceived policy of the immediate withdrawal of all troops negate the benefits of this contribution? Good. Senator Hill. I think, because I was just uh, just saying, Mr. President, the appointment uh, of uh, Major General Molan to such a highly important. Uh, position in the new in the new military headquarters that will be established after the transitions demonstrates how important Australia is regarded as part of the coalition that is helping rebuild Iraq for the Iraqi people. What the opposition is arguing is that that, that contribution should be withdrawn. We should cut and run. We should turn our backs on the Iraqi people in their time of need. We should fail to make a contribution that has at the hope 
of creating a stable and democratic country in the Middle East, an area that is of such strategic importance to the whole global community. Why would you turn your back and fail to meet that responsibility when Australia is being recognised as doing such a good job? Mr President, Mr Latham should think again about this ill-conceived policy. Order. Senator Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I have a question to Senator Hill, the Minister of Defence. And I, uh, it follows on from his selective and misquoting of uh, Mr Latham uh, in the previous question. And I also remind him that we had a long discussion about Iraq at the estimates meeting on the 18th of February, which Order. we discussed the condition of the troops and their role and when they'd be coming home. But putting that to one side for the moment, can the minister confirm that he requested the Secretary of the Department of Defence, Mr Rick Smith, to provide him with advice on briefings of the Leader of the Opposition by members of the ADF or officials of the Department of Defence. Were Mr Smith or his Deputy Secretary, Mr Benighton, given any directions about the contents of the letters? Were they provided with draft letters? Senator Hill. I don't remember Mr Latham saying yesterday, yesterday that he got his information from the hand side, Mr President. He said he got it from Senator Evans. The whole world had the opportunity to know what happened in the Estimates Committee. I suspect Mr Latham didn't read the hand side. I suspect he is ignorant of these matters. I suspect until very recently he had no interest in these matters. If he had an interest, why would he have made this silly policy, this dangerous policy on the run? If he had order. Point of order, Senator. There goes the question of relevance. The minister did his Dorothy Dixer and his rave. What I asked him was a specific question about whether he gave the instructions of the request of the Secretary of the Department of Defence. Will you ask, yep. will you ask the minister to refer to the question Senator Camp and Senator ask Campbell. Senator Campbell to Senator sit down Campbell, and pipe down? Come to order. Senator Campbell, are you reflecting on the chair? Well, I'd ask you to, to remain silent. Senator Evans, your point of order it was regarding relevance. As I stated, Mr. President, the minister hasn't attempted to answer the question at all. Well, He's continued on with his Dorothy Dixer. I'd ask minister, you to bring his attention yeah, well, to the, the question. The minister has three and a half minutes of uh, time left to answer the question. I'd remind him of the question. Senator Hill. Well, Mr. President, I, thought, I actually thought that Senator Evans raised the issue of the Estimates Committee. He was, trying to, he was trying to provide real room for Mr Latham because Mr Latham said he took advice from Senator Evans and Senator Evans hadn't had a briefing for a year. So Senator Evans on the run says, oh yes, but it must have come out of the Estimates Committee. But that's not a briefing, that's advice to the world. The point I was making... Don't smile, Senator Evans. The point I was making is, Order, is that Senator this opposition Evans. leader is not interested in facts. He made this policy on the run. He thought there was some short-term political advantage, some popular position, some popular gain he could get from this policy. And without thinking, without thinking about the consequences to Australian forces, without thinking about the consequences to Iraq, he let this policy go, and since then he's been trying to wriggle out of it. Senator Evans. It says now at another minute and a half, uh, I draw your, question, draw your attention to the question of relevance. I asked him a specific question about the request made to the De Defence Secretary, whether he made it and what, uh, whether he gave instructions about what the letter should contain. I'd ask you to draw his attention to the question. I've ruled and other presidents have ruled that I can't instruct the minister how he's to answer the question. All I can do is remind him of the question and remind him that he has two and a half minutes left. Senator Hill. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. Order, Senator Cook. Senator Cook. Mr. President, Mr. Latham claimed to have been briefed by by defence officials on operational matters in Iraq. I, through my office, asked the secretary of my department whether that is correct. He, Mr. President, asked around the department and said no. No evidence of any briefings for Mr Latham. Similarly, Mr Benighton is on the public record as indicating through the, the letter that's been tabled that there was no operational briefing from him. So, so yesterday, Mr Latham just totally invented this story. Or, uh... Just totally invented this story. And in doing so, in doing so, in doing so did serious damage to a highly respected and professional public servant. 
This is the Labour Party. This is the Labour Party that was telling us how important it was to protect the integrity of public servants only, only a week order. or so Senator ago. Faulkner. What short memories, order. what double standards. Order, Minister. Senator Faulkner continually shouting across the chamber while the Minister is trying to answer the question doesn't help. Yeah. Senator Hill. Mr. President, Mr. President, if, if, it's one thing for Mr. Latham to invent, invent an explanation to try and get himself out of this mess. But what right has he got to undermine the credibility of a highly respected public servant? How many, how many on the other side did Senator Ray go to Mr. Latham and say, "How dare you do this"? Did Senator Faulkner? All of those who were who demanding high standards in relation to the treatment of public Order. servants. Senator, Senator Evans, Senator Cook, Senator Balkus, continually shouting across the chamber is disorderly. It's ruled, been ruled so on many occasions. I'd ask you to come to order, and Senator Campbell, in, interjections by you don't help either. Senator Hill. The interjection was we dragged him into it. We did it. He claimed he got the briefings. He didn't tell the truth. He invented it. No one gave him the briefings. He dragged the public servants into this debate, and he was prepared to kick the public servants Senator in the guts Evans. to try and make a political point. Senator Evans, it's now four and a half minutes since the question was asked, or, and the minister still hasn't brought himself to answer the question. Now you 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 uh, keep bringing us to water in terms of interjections. What we'd like is an answer to the question. Otherwise, there's no point to question time. There's no. There's no point of order. Senator, Senator Hill, withdraw that. Senator, Senator Cook, I'd ask you to withdraw. What you just said was unparliamentary. It, it is unparliamentary. I'm I'd telling ask... the truth. <laughs> Senator Cook, I'd ask you to withdraw that unparliamentary well, language. If you want me to withdraw the truth, I withdraw. I'd ask you to withdraw that unconditionally. I've withdrawn. Mr. Look, President. I don't need your advice, Senator Faulkner. I've withdrawn my statement, Mr. Thank President. You. Senator Hill. It reminds me, it reminds me of the truth he told about the size of the deficit. We all remember that. Senator Cook, the economics minister for the Labor government. The budget is in surplus, as he said. We're $10 Order. million dollars in deficit. Well, that lie. Senator, there's no point of order. You know that. Senator Hill. Senator Hill. I said, Mr. President, my office, me, asked the Secretary to clarify the matter. My office, me, asked Mr. Benighton to clarify the matter. Order. Senator, Senator Evans, supplementary question. Supplementary question, uh, Mr. President. Uh, can the, uh, can the, I think that at the end there, Minister finally addressed the question. I'd like him to confirm that his office asked both Mr Smith to, uh, to respond on the 30th and that again yesterday his office went back to Mr Benighton and asked him to provide more details or, or asked him to specifically reply. Can he also confirm whether or not any specific instruction was given to Mr Benighton in terms of how the letter should be provided and what form it should take? And will the minister ensure that both Mr Smith and Mr Benighton are at the next budget estimates round in order to provide evidence to the budget estimates committee? Senator Hill. They will both be at the estimates committee, Mr President. And I bet they're terrified at the thought of an interrogation from Senator Evans. They're quite big enough to write their own letters, Mr President. And why were they dragged into it? Because the Labor Party. The Labor Party claimed through Mr Latham to have received briefings, which was never the case. Senator never Evans, the case. continually Invented. shouting across the chamber is disorderly, and you know it is. And if the, if the Senate doesn't come to order on both sides of the chamber and cut down the noise, I think I'm very seriously considering a suspending question time. Well, the point of order. The point of order. Uh, What's the point of order, Senator? Well, my point of order is this. You have called opposition senators to order continually during question time today. In my view, and I think in the view of any reasonable person, there has been as much interjection, disorderly conduct, conduct on the government side as there's been on the opposition side. Sure, sure, opposition senators have been interjecting. Fine. And I don't mind opposition senators being called to order when that happens. But I expect you also to apply the standing order, orders 
equally, equally to senators from the government side. Are you side. reflecting on the chair, Senator Conroy? Are you reflecting on the chair? Good. I can't hear him because of interjections. Well, and I would ask yourself. you, Mr. President, to ensure that you apply the standing orders equally to both sides of the chamber. It is a reasonable request, it is a reasonable expectation, and it's certainly mine. Thank you for the lecture, Senator. I will continually rule the way the interjections are called. If you recall, I've called Senator Campbell to order a dozen times today. Are we, going to, are we going to continue with this racket across the chamber, or do you want me to suspend question time? It's up to you. Senator Knowles. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Family and Community Services. I asked the minister if she would update the Senate as to what the Howard government is doing to assist Australian families and what effect other options would have on government policy. Senator Patterson. Well, uh, thank you very much, Senator Niles, and I appreciate the opportunity to reiterate yet again what this government has done for Australian families. As I said earlier, we are giving families now each year $19 billion in assistance, around $2 billion more each year, $2 billion more each year uh, since the introduction of the new tax system. That means that, on average, a family gets about $6,000 a year assistance tax-free uh, to rear their families. The Family Tax Benefit B means that 2,900 goes to families who are eligible each year, or up to $2,900 goes to families each year for each child under five through the FTB payment if a second income earner chooses to stay at home, giving families choice. We've doubled the childcare funding uh, to around $1.5 billion a year, and we've increased uh, childcare places by around 210,000. Now, uh, at the ALP conference in January, Mr Latham said a Labor government would introduce paid maternity leave. And on February the 15th, when asked on the Sunday program by Laurie Oakes if he would introduce paid maternity leave, Wayne Swan said, absolutely, absolutely. And that's why Labor has committed itself to a scheme of paid maternity leave, committed itself. And yet yesterday we had Mark Latham announcing a baby care payment. Now, what has happened in three months where we have Labor claiming a leaked report from the government's work and family task force? And that report proposed a baby care payment. They couldn't even get a name for their program, a new name for their program. So what, we had in, what we've had in three years is uh, no policy in three years, a commitment to paid maternity leave scheme in January at the Labor conference, a recommitment in February by Mr Swan on a national television program of a commitment to a paid maternity leave uh, scheme. And then uh, the next thing we know, we've got the Labor Party with a backflip. And I'm sure there are a few people on the other side taken off guard. We've got a no paid maternity leave and a copycat baby uh, payment policy. We have Mr Swan and the Labor Party bragging for the last six months that they were going to introduce a national paid maternity leave scheme, but they got rolled by their leader. And we have Kevin Rudd being rolled on Iraq, we've got Bob McMullen rolled on Mr. taxation, uh, we've got Senator, Swains— Senator, address the senators and members by the correct title. Mr Kevin Rudd rolled— I'll give you the opportunity to say it again, Mr President. Mr Kevin Rudd rolled uh, on Iraq, Mr Bob McMullen rolled on taxation, and now Mr Swan rolled on maternity leave. Uh, and yesterday, while exactly the same time as Mr Latham was out in Queanbeyan, yet again sitting down with kids, uh, was in here, uh, Senator Collins was in here bagging the Family Tax Benefit Scheme. She was bagging the Family Tax Benefit Scheme. And what do we find when we read the fine detail of the uh, policy, or so-called policy, that Mr Latham put out? It's using the Family Tax Benefit as the framework, the very Family Tax Benefit that Senator C Collins was in here. They're going to say Joan Collins. Senator Collins was Senator in here Kemp. bagging yesterday. Order, Senator Kemp. That must hurt. It must hurt Senator Collins, you know, because there she was bagging that policy, and there was her leader out there using it as a as a uh, framework for this new for their new so-called policy. No paid paternity leave, and now we have FTB as the cornerstone of Labor's copycat policy. 
Well, they've scrapped their commitment to paid maternity leave, and now we've got Labor using Medicare, using the Medicare safety net as part of their funding for their baby scheme, taking the money out of one pocket of a family and, and putting it into the other, a sort of uh, a, a, th a pea and thimble trick. Um, this will mean that, in particular, low-income families will have greater out-of-pocket medical expenses. They'll scrap the safety Order net Minister. for employee Time entitlements, for and that will also has affect lower. Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question follows on the last one from Senator Knowles, is also addressed to Senator Patterson, Minister for Family and Community Services. Can the minister <coughs> confirm that the government has requested a wide-ranging federal police inquiry? into the unauthorised disclosure of a number of sensitive Cabinet in Confidence documents relating to controversial issues in the Family and Community Services portfolio. Does the minister agree with the statement of the secretary of her portfolio, Mr Sul Sullivan, in a departmental circular yesterday when he stated, and I quote him, it would be very disappointing if the possible actions of an individual or individuals affected the reputation of us all. Minister, is the leaking of the contents of Mr Sullivan's memo also an unauthorised disclosure of sensitive information from her department, which now has the reputation of leaking like a sieve under her stewardship? Senator Patterson. You know, I find it really interesting that Labor when they haven't got any policies, when they haven't got any questions, would resort to that sort of question. Of course there will be an investigation. Of course. When Cabinet in Confidence documents are leaked, there is an investigation. That doesn't mean to say that those documents would have come necessarily from my department, but of course it is against the law to leak and it's inappropriate for shadow ministers to actually receive and use uh, leaked documents. But don't worry about that. Mr Swan wouldn't care about that. I remember when Senator Vanstone got a wad of stuff, a wad of stuff from Attorney General. In fact, a whole series of discs which, was shot, which actually would have just blown you apart. What did Senator Vanstone do? She had the decency to take them back. She took them back because she thought that was the approach. But would Labor have done that? Bet your bottom dollar they wouldn't have taken them back. They would have used them. They would have abused them. It is appropriate for an investigation. It reflects on every single person who has had access to that document if it, if it has been leaked. And, it's, and it, there is an investigation ongoing about a number of, of uh, documents, and, it, and the latest one will be included in that. I have no, I, I, that's the normal procedure for that to occur. Senator Faulkner, supplementary, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, doesn't the mounting flood of Cabinet in Confidence documents with her, within uh, her ministerial responsibility uh, indicate that uh, this actually reflects on the minister's handling of sensitive policy issues? On the minister's handling of sensitive policy issues, Concer concerns, of course, which were exacerbated after her apologies last night for bullying a senator. Can the minister inform the Senate? whether the Federal Police Leak Inquiry will extend, will extend to the possible leaking of her Cabinet documents by ministers and other ministerial officers. Order. Senator Patterson. The AFP will determine who uh, is questioned with regard to the leaking of documents. It's a, a, a process that is undertaken by the AFP. And I am sure the AFP will investigate uh, as far as the documents have been circulated and investigate the, the leaking of those documents. I'm not going to comment or interfere with the process that the AFP will undertake. Senator Ridgway. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Ageing, Senator Ian Campbell. Uh, is the minister aware that the Senate yesterday agreed that the national emergency in Indigenous health is a matter of urgent priority and called on the government to address this situation in the upcoming budget in May? Does the minister agree that the current approaches to Indigenous health care are clearly not working and what is needed is an end to defensive politics and buck passing and a new commitment to addressing this crisis immediately? How will the government respond to the Senate's call in a practical way? And will the minister commit to providing extra emergency funding in this year's budget to address the critical need for primary health care services for Indigenous communities? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Ian Campbell. 
Well, thank you uh, very much, President. Can I firstly commend Senator Ridgway for bringing on that motion uh, yesterday? Uh, and I think he did it in a true spirit of trying to raise the awareness of uh, the parliament and the people of uh, Australia um, about the plight of Indigenous uh, people. Uh, and I think it was a worthwhile debate. Sadly, as, as Senator Ridgway will know, Mr. President, I was in the chamber at the time and heard uh, a, an outrageous, outrageous contribution to the debate by uh, a Labor Party spokesman, I think indeed their spokesman on Indi Indigenous affairs, uh, which uh, ensured that certainly the first, the first part of that debate, Mr. President, and, uh, uh, was in fact um, turned into a, uh, a nasty, partisan, cheap political uh, debate that, that in fact uh, Senator Ridgway, I'm sure, would agree with me. Uh, denigrated and uh, detracted from his uh, initiative. Uh, the coalition, as Senator Ridgway knows better than most senators in this place, because I know he and I have worked together before he was a senator on improving the, the plight of uh, Indigenous Australians in a range of uh, areas uh, through our engagement on the land fund debate, has uh, come to uh, significantly improve the resources uh, going into Indigenous health. For example, funding for uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Program stands at more than $272 million uh, in this year, which is a growth of just under 100 per cent uh, since 1996. And I think the point that uh, Senator Ridgway makes is that even with that nearly 100 per cent increase of funding uh, directly uh, spent uh, on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, program, uh, that program, uh, that we're not getting the sort of improvements uh, that he and I would like to see for Indigenous Australians uh, in their health outcomes and in, in mortality rates, which do, uh, of course, uh, compare very badly uh, internationally uh, in terms of the health, health of Indigenous people. So to the question as to can we uh, and should we look at uh, policy options for improving the benefit that Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders receive from that substantial Commonwealth uh, assistance for uh, health, uh, the answer, of course, is a resounding yes. And I don't think anybody in this chamber uh, would, would contradict us. Um, in the uh, primary health care area, the Commonwealth in the 1999-2000 uh, budget allocated uh, $78.8 million over four years. Uh, to specifically uh, address Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's access to primary health care uh, through the Primary Health Care Access Program. That is, that is a one specific program that was developed in consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to ensure that they could get uh, good access to primary health care. And I think Senator Ridgway, Mr President, would uh, agree that that is one of the sorts of programs that we need to uh, put more uh, policy energy into and, if necessary, uh, better resources uh, to ensure that we uh, in, in increase the, uh, the, the, the outcomes. In terms of the budget question, which Senator Ridgway addresses quite properly in the uh, lead-up to the, uh, the budget in May, uh, I think he would be um, surprised if I was to answer what the budget outcome will be. We'll be back on the next sitting day. The Treasurer will bring down the, uh, the budget on next sitting week and uh, clearly uh, budget outcomes for the Indigenous Affairs portfolio will be announced quite properly by the Treasurer uh, at that time. Senator Ridgway, supplementary question. Uh, supplementary, Mr President. I thank the, uh, the Minister for his answer. I was hoping that the resounding yes was uh, uh, in anticipation of any budget announcements. Uh, is the Minister aware that uh, Professor John Diebel has estimated uh, for the Australian Medical Association that an additional uh, $300 million per year is urgently needed to address the crisis in Indigenous health and that this estimate is comprised of $250 million to provide adequate primary health care services as well as $50 million or $12 per Indigenous person per year for public health and preventative programs such as health promotion, health education and screening. Uh, does the Minister agree that the cost of inaction now will blow out the uh, virtually unsustainable expenses into the future, uh, will the minister give some undertaking or guarantee that uh, $300 million for Indigenous primary health care uh, can and will be provided in this year's budget? Senator Campbell. 
Uh, Mr. President, I, I, I clearly can't give a commitment to what will be in the budget. That would be uh, extraordinary and uh, would be a uh, defiance of sound uh, government process. You do, do need to ensure that you have a, a proper policy review, a review of the expenditures, uh, and of course a proper focus on improving policy outcomes. And the uh, the budget outcome need, needs to affect that. One figure uh, I think I'd like to have on the record, since Senator Ridgway has given me the chance, Mr. President, is to say that uh, total Australian government funding is in fact a dollar fifteen per capita for Indigenous Australians for every one dollar spent on non-Indigenous Australians. So we are putting in a significant uh, effort to address the quite clear and demonstrable and well-documented deficit in terms of Indigenous uh, health outcomes. And we welcome Senator Ridgway's encouragement and, the, and, and other people like Professor Diebel, I think you pronounce his name, um, to uh, drawing the government's attention to Order that Minister, and proposing uh, time for action the question has expired. Senator Ray. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Hill, representing the Foreign Minister. Minister, given that today you have confirmed you asked Mr. Smith and Mr. Benighton for letters, can you tell us who asked the Director General of ASIS for his letter regarding the briefing with the opposition leader? Was it the Foreign Minister, Mr. Downer? Was it the Department of Foreign Affairs? Or did he provide the letter of his own volition? When uh, Mr. David Irvine provided the letter, was he informed that it was going to become a public document that, that is released uh, by the Foreign Minister? And uh, was he at all appraised of the fact that it may be a matter of political controversy once it was released? Senator Hill. And in view of the detail it sought in that question, I'll refer it to the Foreign Minister for an early response. Senator Ray, supplementary question? Well, probably on a related matter of briefings, uh, can I ask the Minister? Given the fact that today, um, both representing himself and I take it the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister, he has said there has not been an, uh, enough requests for briefing by opposition members, will in future opposition members be able to fully minute those briefings if disputation occurs? And more on the subject of briefing, why have members of the Labor Party been barred by you from visiting Amberley in Queensland uh, to try to get themselves briefed and across issues? When in fact, in the six years in which I was Defence Minister, I never refused one coalition member a base visit. Order. Senator Kemp. Senator Kemp and Senator Cook. Order. Senator Hill. Um, well, the, the first uh, part of the supplementaries raises interesting issues because, of course, I guess in future Mr Benighton would need to be accompanied by. Uh, as an, another party, an honest broker in effect. Why did he go by himself? Because it, he didn't dream, of course, that he would be verbaled by Mr Latham in this way. Because traditionally it hasn't been necessary to have somebody vouch for the public servant. Why didn't we, why didn't we accompany Mr Benighton? Because that hasn't been necessary. That hasn't been necessary in the past either. What's, the, what's changed? What's changed, Mr President, is Mr Latham who is prepared to verbal a public servant for short-term political gain. And in, relation to, uh, in relation to briefings, Mr President, I would have thought that most in the opposition would say that I have been open and helpful. I have always sought to be. I have always sought to be, because I actually believe that the opposition has got a right to be briefed. And in most instances, I've also thought it's unnecessary to have somebody Order else Minister, attend to, to time for, answering the for the truth. Supplementary questions expired. Senator Lees. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Minchin, uh, the minister representing uh, the Minister for Industry. Uh, does the minister agree that Australia's needs for generating electricity uh, is actually increasing, and that, uh, as well as building new gen generating capacity, uh, we're also going to need to replace old infrastructure? Does the minister agree that new wind turbines with no greenhouse gas emissions are cheaper than new coal-fired power stations that will have to rely on, ga on gas sequestration to reduce emissions? And finally, will the government agree to increase the mandatory target for renewable energy, which will further reduce the cost of renewable energy? The Minister for Finance, Senator Minchin. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Lees for that question and acknowledge her interest in um, renewable energy and alternative forms of energy, I think something that uh, all Australians share some interest in. Uh, it should be said at the outset, however, that Australia's abundant uh, and generous reserves of uh, traditional sources of power—to uh, wit coal and gas 
uh, do give us an extraordinary uh, competitive advantage in the world. Uh, coal exports uh, are also a very, very major source of uh, income for Australia and a major source of power for many other nations around the world that need cheap, reliable sources of power. So I don't think uh, I would want to say anything that uh, uh, detracted from the importance of our traditional reliance on coal-fired and gas-fired power stations to provide the baseload power uh, which Australia very, very much needs in order to provide ordinary Australians with uh, relatively cheap and reliable power uh, and to ensure that Australian industry uh, is appropriately competitive in an increasingly competitive world. Uh, nevertheless, there is, um, we strongly believe, a proper place uh, for uh, supplementation of that baseload capacity uh, by, um, uh, by alternative forms of energy. And, uh, Indeed, I was uh, recently visited in Aminka to look at the um, geothermal project uh, that's being um, tested and developed uh, in Inaminka in our state of South Australia, which I think has uh, very, very exciting uh, potential to be a source of alternative power. Um, in relation to um, the mandatory renewable energy target measure introduced by this government, it's been in place for over two years and is expected to produce a 60 per cent increase in electricity generation from renewable sources over a decade. Uh, an estimated two to three billion dollars of additional investment in renewable energy will be stimulated over the life of the uh, MRET, as it's known. Uh, the recent report of an independent review of the MRET legislation indicates that that measure is meeting its objective and that Australia is well on its way to achieving its renewable energy target. Uh, the government does remain committed to the MRET scheme and is currently examining the recommendations of the report and when we come to conclusions on the basis of that report they will be announced. Senator Lee, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I thank, do thank the minister for his interest in this area. But I ask him, is it not the case that Australia also has an abundant amount of sun and wind and that could we not lead the world in this new technology if the government was to increase uh, the MRET target? Does the minister agree that if we further encourage the use of renewable energy, that uh, by 2015 wind could be competitive, indeed will be competitive with gas and shortly after competitive with coal? And finally, I ask the minister, is it not the case that we are in fact well short of that 2 per cent target when you actually look at genera generating capacity, that it really is, so far, the amount generated by alternative sources is still nowhere near that 2 per cent? Senator Minchin. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Look, I, I don't have before me the exact proportion that has been reached to this point. Um, you know, I'm not going to repeat what I said to you about the success of the pro program, which I think has been successful. I'll have to uh, get confirmation of the question of whether it's achieved the 2 per cent at this point or not. Um, I think you know, all Australians do acknowledge the, uh, uh, the potential for solar and wind power, although both of them tend to be controversial. Uh, I certainly have some solar heating at uh, my place, but uh, I notice in South Australia there is controversy over wind, uh, wind power, the wind turbines, the effects on the environment, the uh, aesthetics of regions, but I do think Australians do expect that their governments, as we are and will continue to do, uh, put a considerable emphasis on the importance of exploiting our abundant uh, uh, reserves of solar and wind power, and something I personally am quite committed to. Senator O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Vanstone, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs. Can the Minister confirm that her Indigenous Affairs Agency, ATSIS, has withheld $640,000 of vital infrastructure funding to the homelands in the Anangu Pichinjara lands during the current financial year? Can the Minister confirm this funding was withheld while a review of capital works projects was undertaken, denying homeland communities essential services during the hottest months of the year? Is it the case that the review was completed in January this year and in fact made favourable findings about the Capital Works Program, yet that funding continues to be withheld? Minister, why do you continue to withhold funding for essential water and power works in the AP lands, thus denying some of the most disadvantaged people in Australia access to basic services? The Minister for Indigenous Affairs. Senator Thank you, Mr President. Um, I don't have advice with me at the moment on the $650,000 to which the uh, Shadow Minister refers, and I'll take that on notice and get an answer. But 
In relation to the pitlands, there are a number of matters that are important to bear in mind. Uh, in relation to services, I note that the South Australian Deputy Premier has taken some very strong uh, steps in the pitlands and um, that he has uh, been able to deal with that problem, uh, thankfully, at last, uh, without uh, interference or political um, fight infighting uh, from the Commonwealth. Um, a lesson I would have thought perhaps the opposition at the Commonwealth level could learn. Nonetheless, uh, in relation to the pitlands, um, the Deputy Premier did speak to me about this matter before he did it. Uh, I told him that uh, I, I, I thought something had to be done, and uh, it's important to understand. Uh, I told him, and I think it's important the Senate understands, that the problems in the pitlands today frankly haven't been helped by the South Australian government. And you might ask yourself, why is not where is the Indigenous Affairs Minister at the South Australian state level? Where is Terry Roberts? Where is Terry Roberts? He's the Indigenous Affairs Minister. You know, hello, where are you? We haven't heard anything from him. And there's a reason for that. There is a reason for that. There's a reason that the Deputy Premier has taken over this matter and Mr Roberts is no longer involved. In 2001, the former South Australian government, in consultation with the Pitlands executive, appointed a change manager to tackle governance and administrative uh, problems in 2001. There were major problems there, there still are, that prompted that intervention. The change manager was appointed and was making real progress. Things, however, changed when the RAND government took office 18 months ago. My advice is that the minister, Mr Roberts, who is now no longer to be seen, went with the department head, Mr Buckskin, who used to be a federal public servant with whom I've worked, um, to support to the people that were opposed to the new governance structure being developed. As a matter of interest, two gentlemen and the South Australia um, Premier's uh, former adviser, Mr Randall Ashbourne, went to the AP Council AGM when the former executive was ousted. So you had the executive of the pitlands recognising change was needed, working with the government to get a change manager, and then you had the new government minister going up with the head of his department, someone from the Premier's office, and uh, basically supporting the people who wanted to get rid of the executive who were fixing the problem. Days later, the newly appointed chair of the executive, appointed with the support of the Labor government, sacked the change manager. Oh. Sacked the change manager. We can tell you a bit more about the change manager if you'd like to go down this path. I'd prefer not to make Aboriginal politics a cheap political issue. I've known, well, I hear scoffing on the other side. I've known about this for a long time, but you raised it, Senator, and I'm just advising you that there's plenty more where this came from. Plenty more. Days later, the new change manager was sacked. The state government appointed a new consultant uh, without consulting the Commonwealth and without consulting ATSIS. He was previously the CEO of the National Indigenous Development Association that shut down when it lost up to $6 million of ATSIC money. That's who the state government, in effect, helped get appointed to the pitlands by changing the pitlands, helping to change the executive Order of the Minister, pitlands that recognise the problem. The Plenty more to say expired. where this comes from. Senator O'Brien, supplementary, supplementary question, question uh, Mr. President. I note that the, uh, the minister has an extensive brief on, of a political nature on this matter. Can the minister advise why she has not been apparently briefed by her agency about the withholding of $640,000 of very important infrastructure money? for this particular region, some of the most disadvantaged people in the country. The minister says she doesn't have any information about the activities of her agency, but she wants to present to the Senate her spin on the political situation of the agency. Why does the, has the minister asked for information about the activities of her agency, or is she simply interested in making political points? Senator Vanstone. Uh, Mr President, uh, I didn't say the information isn't available. I simply said I don't have it with me now. I certainly don't have information on every dollar the Commonwealth spends in every area. Um, but uh, since I've made it clear that the former executive of the pitlands wanted to do something about it, 
was in the process of doing something. That executive was removed with the support of the state government. And then this man was appointed, from the, who had been the National Indigenous Development Association CEO, and that was shut down when it lost $6 million. I mentioned uh, Mr. Buckskin. Mr. Buckskin's brother was appointed as the general manager. The South Australian government effectively dismantled a joint Commonwealth state remedial package that was trying to do something sensible in the pitlands. Mr. Roberts has done nothing since then, and that is why uh, he's now out of the picture on this issue, and Mr. Foley has taken over and more strength to his arm. We have a COAG trial there. We will work cooperatively with the state government Order, and with the local people Time to fix the problems. Time for answering the question has yeah, expired. Yeah, yeah. Senator Santoro. President, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Immigration, Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs, Senator Vanstone. Will the minister inform the Senate of the government's ongoing commitment to delivering economic benefits to Australia through its migration program? Senator Vanstone. Thanks very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Santoro for the. Uh, a question. Uh, Queensland, like all the states in Australia, is benefiting from a growing economy and, of course, would benefit from uh, migration. Uh, I'm pleased to say that the government has been able to announce today that we are increasing both the skill level of migrants coming to Australia and the numbers that are coming, and that we'll be able to focus that increase and those skills on, on regional Australia. We're doing this by increasing the skills uh, pass mark for the general skilled independent visa categories for permanent residents from 115 to 120. Rising demand allows us to attract migrants with a higher level of skill. The pass mark was last increased in 2002. It's rising demand that allows us to do this. And the message there is people around the world want to come to a country that is well run, that has an economy going well, where they can get a job and have a, a, a more prosperous future. We will, of course, be protecting international students currently completing uh, their studies in, in Australia. Skilled migration brings benefits to us all. Our migrants with business skills have also fostered long-term links with international markets, generated jobs and exports, produced goods and services that would otherwise be imported into Australia, introduced new and better technology and enhanced commercial activity and competition. All in all, it's a very positive story. It seems only logical we'd want to encourage this type of migration. That was actually a quote from Peter Beatty, uh, the Premier of uh, Queensland. Equally, the Premier of my state, uh, Mike Rann, yesterday um, announced that South Australia's new population policy uh, was, he thinks is terribly important. He points out population growth holds the key to our state's future prosperity and sustainability, to which end the state is setting some aggressive and ambitious targets to at least double the intake of independent skilled migrants. So I'm pleased to see that the Labor states will, in fact, and I trust the opposition, will welcome the fact that we are in a country now that can afford to increase uh, its immigration intake, that we can have uh, skills migrants with even better skills than before. Uh, this increase of 5,000 will be targeted uh, to where the states want to go. It will operate through uh, skills um, uh, visas that will be sponsored by the states, so those states that want more people will be able to have them, and those states that don't choose to sponsor migrants, uh, these migrants uh, won't in fact need to have them. Uh, it's important also to uh, understand that we will have more doctors coming to Australia, another thousand places for doctors and their families in 2004 5 uh, It's important, I think, to understand that modelling by access economics estimates that the migration program will contribute over $4 billion to the Commonwealth budget over the next four years. This 2004-05 program will deliver the largest skill stream uh, in Australia's history. The largest skill stream uh, in Australia's history. Can I conclude, uh, Mr President, by quoting from uh, Mr Ross Garneau, who uh, wrote the monograph Migration to Australia and Comparison with the United States, who benefits? in May 2003, and he said immigration with a high skill component tends to raise employment and lower unemployment of low-skilled established Australians. That is everything this government is about, bringing here people who will generate jobs and who will help lower-skilled Australians get more jobs. A well-managed economy can do that for you. That's why Labor should never, ever be re-elected. Senator Collins. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Patterson as Minister for Family and Community Services. How Order. Senator Hill. How does the how does the minister respond to her colleagues' expressed concerns about her serial incompetence as a minister, including, including her failure to protect families with disabled children from disability payment reviews, her failure to insist on the domestic violence advertising campaign be screened, especially in the face of the escalating number of football harassment and rape allegations? Her failure to curtail family tax breaks for upper income and millionaire families, her failure to secure confidential documents within her department and office, her failure to secure prime ministerial correspondence, her failure to come up with the barbecue stopping work and family package, her failure to fix the family tax bet bungle, and her failure time and time again to explain the government's agenda in this parliament. It's a long Should... question. Senator Patterson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. <laughs> Order. How Order. desperate they must be. I've repeated, How... Senator, I've repeatedly said this week that senators on both sides of the chamber to come to order when a minister or a, or a senator is asking a question and answering a question. That hasn't been the case again today, and I'd ask you to remain silent while the minister answers the question. Senator Patterson. Mr President, how desperate they must be. That didn't constitute a question. It constituted sledging. I don't think it deserves an answer. Point of order. Senator. Mr President, could I ask you to review, seriously review that question to see whether it is in fact in, uh, in, in order, under Standing Order 73? It seemed to me that it contained arguments, inferences, imputation, epithets, ironical expressions, hypothetical matter, sought an expression of an opinion um, and uh, was basically and Mr and Mr President was basically out of order on about seven out of ten counts understanding order seventy three. Senator Faulkner. I think it is a good idea for you to review it and you might say you see uh, Mr President it contains an awful lot of facts. Well I will look at the question but Senator uh, Senator Collins you do have a supplementary question I believe. Yes, I do. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Whilst we're on the subject of sledging, I remind the minister of her excuse yesterday that one of her staff was overzealous in dealing with a fellow senator. The question: When will the minister accept responsibility for her own failures as a minister, instead of blaming her staff, her predecessor, the prime minister, the media, the opposition with sledging? Her department and just about everybody else except herself. Well, that's, that's another question. I don't believe. I don't believe that question's in order. I mean, it, it's just asking for an opinion, and um, I don't think that would be in order. But I will have a look at that one as well. Your point of order. Uh, Senator Collins has asked a question about when the minister, Senator Patterson, will accept responsibility. Order for her own actions, in this case her own failures, of course, and stop blaming others. Surely, Mr President, sure, well, surely, Mr. President such questions— no, order, I'm on a point order. of order. Senator, hold, your, hold your tongue. Take your seat, Senator. Hold your tongue. Take your seat. Oh. Uh, Senator Falkland. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I would uh, submit to you that uh, presidents have consistently ruled in such questions, consistently, certainly in the 15 years I've been here, and I'm sure before that. And I, so I, I would, I would, maybe, uh, I would ask. So, so when you, when you review it, what I'm asking you, Mr. President, given that you've been asked to review it, and you've indicated you will. Fair enough. But when you do it, could I ask you to look at rulings of previous presidents in relation to very similar questions? Minister, do you wish to answer that question that, that I've ruled out of order? I don't actually accept it's no. a question, Mr. Right. Mr. President. I think it would be in the best interest of the Senate if I ask that further questions put on notice. Good idea. Senator Hill. Uh, Senator Ray asked me a question uh, which I said I'd refer to the Foreign Minister. Uh, his office has advised me that Mr. Downer requested the letter from Mr Irvine and that Mr Irvine was aware that it might become public.
those senators not seeking the call leave the chamber or take their seat, I do have a brief statement to make. Uh, yesterday, um, the Deputy President, Senator Hogg, undertook to refer to me a ruling which he made on a point of order which was raised in relation to parts of a speech made by Senator O'Brien. There were two parts to the point of order that Senator O'Brien was reading his speech and that remarks he made about the Prime Minister were unparliamentary. In regard to the question, I, I have asked senators to resume their seats or lose the cha leave the chamber. Order. In regard to the question about reading speeches, the Deputy President ruled that the prohibition on reading of speeches was not applied rigidly and that senators were allowed to refer to notes in relation to technical matters. I think that the Deputy President's ruling was correct. It is a long-standing practice in the Senate that senators may refer to notes in the course of their speeches and may refer closely to notes when dealing with detailed matters. In regard to the question about whether unparliamentary language was used, on reading the hand said, I do believe that an imputation about a member of another place may have been made. Such imputations are out of order and all occupants of the chair are vigilant about that. In the circumstances, however, senators from both sides were freely interjecting across the chamber. In such situations, it is often difficult for the chair to hear each interjection, all of which, of course, of course are out of order. It is also clear to me from reading the hand said that remarks were made by other senators which, had they been brought to the attention of the chair, would certainly have been ruled as unparliamentary. I believe that the Deputy President correctly ruled that while remarks made by Senator O'Brien, which were the subject of the point of order, were skating close to the mark, and that Senator O'Brien should be careful in describing and attributing motives to other people in his opinion, he did not regard the language used as unparliamentary. With the benefit of the, of the transcript, I do believe it is unparliamentary for, for a senator to link a member of the other place, or indeed another senator, to something that otherwise would be highly unparliamentary by su suggesting tacit support. This sort of implication is unacceptable. I make two final points. It is unparliamentary to reflect on the chair during any debate or to misrepresent a ruling made by the chair. If a senator wants to dissent in a ruling, that must be done in accordance with Standing Order 198. I also again remind senators that it is highly disorderly to shout remarks across the chamber, and it's particularly disorderly to do so when the chair is endeavouring to consider a point of order. All senators should be framed from that behaviour. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Faulkner. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, I move the Senate take note of answers to questions directed to the Leader of the Government uh, in the Senate, Senator Hill, in question time today. Mr. President, Mr. Howard is the only Prime Minister of Australia ever to have embroiled our intelligence agencies in domestic political debate. No other Prime Minister has ever done it. No other Prime Minister in memory would even have considered such a course of action would be appropriate. Now, Mr. Mr Deputy President, these private confidential briefings of the Leader of the Opposition by senior intelligent officials are a long-standing convention. In the case of ASIS and ASIO, they are underpinned by legislation. Section 19 of the Intelligence Services Act, for example, requires the Director-General of ASIS to consult regularly with the Leader of the Opposition for the purpose of keeping him or her informed of matters relating to ASIS. By bringing these briefings into the public domain, the Prime Minister, Mr Howard, has compromised their value. Why would officials give full and frank briefings in future, knowing they may well be made public, whenever they might serve the supposed partisan interests of the government? Will leaders of the opposition continue to seek such briefings, knowing that their privacy and their confidentiality may not be respected by government? Is the public interest served by the politicisation and corruption of this very important convention that uh, stood until now, 
the test of time. Obviously, that's not the view of this. But, 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 but does the Prime Minister, ostensibly in our system, the, the guardian of these conventions, care about these matters? He does not care. What he does is coerce public servants in this country into supporting the government line, and that is now a familiar tactic of Mr Howard and the government. He's extracted a letter from the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He's extracted a letter from the Secretary of the Department of Defence. He's extracted a letter, he's extracted a le uh, a letter from the, uh, from the uh, Director General of ASIS. He's got another one from the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Defence. Poor Mr Benighton, he's probably on the rack right now as we speak. On the rack again. He's got him to sign up to no doubt he'll get him to sign up to an even more fulsome description of his briefing with Mr. Latham. The last one didn't quite do the trick, because the Prime Minister today has run away, tail between his, his, his legs, licking his wounds, because he's been bested by Mr. Latham in the Parliament on this issue, because the Prime Minister is wrong. Now this, remember, Mr. Mr. Deputy President, this is the same Prime Minister who used classified intelligence to try and back up his claim that kids had been thrown overboard. He's the same Prime Minister who used the Office of National Assessments to dig himself out of a hole on WMD. We all know about that. Same Prime Minister who demanded retractions from Vice Admiral Shackleton. Same Prime Minister who stood over Police Commissioner Kelty, and uh, when, of course, all these people, all these people, departed from the government line, even though they told the truth to the Australian people, even though they told this truth, and this is the modus operandi of uh, of the government: the use of public servants and the use of classified information for partisan political purposes. How low can you go? How low can you go? That is the hallmark, Mr Deputy President, of the Howard government. And there's only one way to, to stop this. That is to remove John Howard from the prime ministership. He is a person who won't change his spots. This is a pattern of behaviour, a pattern of behaviour that is utterly despicable utterly contemptible. He has indulged in this destructive behaviour far too often. And until John Howard's removed from office, he'll continue to abuse these long-standing conventions. Your time what has this expired, says is, of course, Senator Faulkner. Your time. S Senator, Senator Ferguson. Uh, yeah. uh, Senator Ray. I interrupt my leader when he was so destroying the government, but Senator Brandis deliberately and maliciously on two occasions was unparliamentary. Given the homily read out by the president, I do think he should withdraw. He knows he should, and he should do it now. Senator Brandis. Uh, Senator Ferguson. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. Well, one would think that it's the last uh, taking note of answers. When you finish, Senator, Senator Faulkner, you've Senator, already had one go. S Senator Ferguson. <laughs> when you've had a go. <laughs> Senator, Can I Senator, say, Senator Ferguson? Mr. S uh, Senator Faulkner, Senator Ferguson has the call. Mr. Mr. Deputy President, one could be forgiven for thinking that this is the last taking note of answers on the very last day of a uh, sitting, sitting session because, uh, can I say, Senator, Senator Faulkner said, how low can you go? Well, I'd have to say about as low as Senator Faulkner got in taking note of the answers today. About that low, because Senator, all Senator Faulkner uh, could come up with was a whole range of criticism of the Prime Minister based on some very, very loose facts. Some very, very loose facts. And what we need to remember, of course, is that Mr Latham has put himself in this position. He's put himself there because of his use of Mr Benighton uh, to justify some of the statements that he's made in relation to withdrawing troops from Iraq. He used Mr Benighton. He used a private briefing to justify every statement that he's made in his policy bungle 
and he realises it's a policy bungle to bring our troops home immediately from Iraq. And we heard from the leader of the opposition, uh, the leader of the government in the Senate today, saying how important the work is that those people are doing in Iraq, in the reconstruction uh, of Iraq, and in making sure that the people of Iraq have a better life in the future. We hear Senator Faulkner talk, talk about coercion of public servants. What rubbish! What rubbish! People who have provided information to the government of their own free will, uh, letters that are freely given, not extracted. But it sounds good for Senator Faulkner. It sounds good for Senator Faulkner to stand up and say that these people were coerced into doing these sorts of things. He says, "Mr. Benighton's on the rack." He says, "Mr. Benighton's on the rack." Well, if Mr. Benighton's on the rack, it's because of Mr. Latham, not because of anything that this government's done. It's because of Mr Latham and Mr Latham's use of a private briefing that is normally given to leaders of the opposition when they assume that role, when it's normally given to them when they assume that role, a briefing on an, an overview of what the role of that department is. And so Mr Latham says he had, a, he had an express briefing, and from the information gained from that meeting from Mr Benighton, he said that he determined that our policy in Iraq was chaos. What rubbish! What rubbish! It was never said at that briefing, and Mr. Benighton has already said, Mr. Benighton has said that there was, um, that he has already said that that is not the substance of what was said during that briefing. There is nothing sensitive. There is nothing sensitive about the identities or the positions held by Mr. Irvine or Mr. Benighton, uh, and the information that was provided to the House in no way compromises the identities of members of our intelligence agencies. Another issue raised by Mr Latham today, and one which nobody in this place believes, and Mr Latham is spending all of yesterday, all of today, trying to get out of a policy position that he espoused, I guess without any consultation with his colleagues, because uh, he hasn't consulted the caucus with any other of his major decisions in relation to defence and relation to uh, withdrawal from Iraq. Well, plenty of your guys say so, Senator Ludwig, plenty of your guys say so, so we know that it must be true. Um, but the, lead, the leader of the opposition's claims and the claims made here by Senator Faulkner today, when Senator Faulkner stoops to the same old record, you know, back we go to the history of this government because he can't find any other way to justify what Mr uh, Latham has said. But Mr Latham's um, uh, uh, claims are completely unfounded and they only serve to confirm his ignorance about the operation of our intelligence agencies uh, and the associated conventions that have been developed in this parliament and have been conventions that have been uh, recognised by governments uh, for a long time now. The Prime Minister provided the information to the House yesterday uh, and the day before to clarify the contents of briefings, because Mr Latham used those briefings, his so-called briefings, lengthy briefings, he said, which we know now weren't lengthy briefings. He used those because Mr Latham used those to justify the policy position that he took in relation to our troops in Iraq. The troops in Iraq don't agree with his position. Scarcely any public commentator in Australia agrees with the policy decision taken by Mr Latham. Scarcely any policy, uh, any policy commentator, and certainly the people of Australia don't agree with Mr Latham. The people, the, the people of Australia, the people of Australia don't agree with Mr Latham. At least 61 of them percent of them have said, we want our troops to stay in Iraq because we want them to finish the job. And so Mr Latham's, Mr. Latham's policy on the run, this ridiculous policy Sen of withdrawing Senator our troops, Ferguson, is one that should be refuted. Your time has expired. Senator Ray. Well, uh, let me first answer the question posed by Senator Ferguson on the 61 per cent. I any analysts know that was a ridiculous question to ask, because the proposition that was put do you believe you should stay till the job is done or pull out immediately, which isn't a really a question posed by anyone in politics in Australia other than maybe the Greens? So it was an absolute sham of a poll. The second point I'd uh, like to make, Senator Hill said at question time today he was quite generous with briefings. Well, I have no reason really to disagree with that, that he has been generous. He might set an example, in fact, for some of his other colleagues who are not so generous in terms of briefings, that won't allow uh, newspaper clipping services to be delivered to shadow ministers like I and many others ensured occurred when we were in government. But I'll accept his basic point. 
that he is generous. But I do remember my colleagues saying in the first quarter of 2003 that the briefings they got on Iraq were shallow and next to useless. They didn't tell me what was in the briefings, quite properly. But they did say they learned a lot more out of newspapers and television than they did from those briefings. And sometimes, sometimes you get immune from those sort of briefings if you think they're not enough value. And that was a problem. I ensured in 1991 that there was a daily brief of the opposition defence and foreign affairs spokesman on, the, on events in that first Iraqi conflict. I ensured that that happened and I ensured that they were top quality people that gave the opposition a full briefing on that. Of course, on some occasions, oppositions don't want to be briefed. They don't want to be locked into a confidential discussion, and that's fair enough, because that restricts their public comment and therefore can be avoided. I did make the point today that not always is it available to members of parliament to go and get briefed. I used one example. Senator Hill or his office vetoed a colleague of mine going to Amberley. I find that passing strange. I don't find it typical of Senator Hill's behaviour. But he's complained to me and I've no reason to disagree. I never once as defence minister over six years stopped a opposition member going on a base. On two occasions I got an urgent phone call from the gatehouse saying opposition spokesmen had turned up with candidates in tow. Can they have permission to go on base? And I automatically ticked it. That generosity apparently is not always reciprocated. But the real problem we're facing here is in order to get political advantage, we are seeing a tendency to politicise the public service, all of which may be an irreversible trend. But it shouldn't happen with intelligence agencies. Those we do exempt. We exempt them from a degree of scrutiny. We extend them a much greater degree of trust in their behaviour than we do any other government department. And in return, we expect them to behave in an independent uh, manner. The reason I ask the question today, in terms of who asked the Director General of ASIS to provide the letter, because I wanted to know whether he did it of his own volition or whether he was asked by a minister. Now, the answer given today was, well, it was Minister Downer, fair enough, but also that Mr Irvine was made aware that his letter may be made public. I doubt that. I frankly doubt that. And was he given a choice in those circumstances not to provide the letter if he knew it was going to become a matter of partisan political dispute? Therein, I think, lies part of the difficulty here. We want to trust the people put in charge of the intelligence agencies in Australia. We don't want them involved in partisan politics. I think that's true of most people on most sides of politics. It is not true of our current Prime Minister, who would do anything, anything to get political advantage. This confusion between his own persona, his own political self-interest and the national in interest is indivisible in his own mind. But what is happening in this is that the whole process of politics is being debased by him and by his actions, by them ringing up the police commissioner and slapping him around, by standing over public servants to produce letters for their own partisan uh, requirements. None of this is healthy for the body politic, Mr. A Mr Deputy President. Most of it denigrates some of the great jobs done by our intelligence agencies over the last two decades. I find it very, very sad that it slipped into this thing. We will now need to have note takers and minute takers at every briefing in future so we won't have our views distorted by government. We're going to have Senator to either tape record Ray, your them time or has take expired. them. Senator Brandis. Deputy President, uh, let us ask ourselves this question. Who is politicising the role of the intelligence agencies and the chiefs of the intelligence agencies? The person who gave a briefing? No. The person who accurately and faithfully corrected the public record, the Prime Minister? Or, or the person who misrepresented to the parliament and to the public what the content of that briefing was? I think, Mr Deputy President, that most sensible people would think that the actor in that sequence 
who drag the intelligence chiefs into po political controversy was the person who misrepresented what had been said in a, con in a confidential briefing, not the person, either the intelligence chiefs or the Prime Minister, who put the public record straight. Let me take you through it, Mr. Uh, Mr Deputy President. The Leader of the Opposition, Mr Latham, made a claim that the Deputy Secretary, Intelligence and Security in the Department of Fe Defence, Mr Benighton, a respected, senior, non-partisan public servant, had in the course of a briefing attacked the government's policy on Iraq. And that claim by Mr Latham, I can't say it was a lie because that would be unparliamentary, but it was at variance with the truth. Mr Benighton prepared a memorandum shortly after that briefing was given last year, not in the heat of this political controversy in, of, the, of the past few days, Mr Deputy President, but last year, shortly after the briefing was given in January, was it, Senator Hill? Thank you. In January of this year, well before the heat of this political controversy, and that memorandum, that, that, that memorandum of the briefing, the content of which, because of its security classification, cannot be put into the public domain, but the substance of which the Prime Minister summarised in the House of Representatives yesterday and offered to show on a confidential basis to the Leader of the Opposition, consistent with document handling procedures for documents of that security classification, confirms that no, there was no discussion of any operational matters in relation to the Australian military forces in Iraq given during that briefing. That is what Mr Benighton said, not this week when it had become controversial, but two months ago, before there was any suggestion of controversy about this, before the fact of the briefing was even public knowledge. That is the evidence, the best evidence, of what Mr Benighton said and, more importantly, what he didn't say. That has now been confirmed by Mr Benighton, whose integrity in this matter is beyond question, beyond a shadow of a doubt, by a letter which has been put into the public domain by the Prime Minister yesterday and corroborated by, the, um, by Mr Irvin, the Director General of ACES. So, Mr Deputy President, if you ask yourself who is more likely to be telling the truth, Mr Latham or Mr Benighton, if you ask yourself the question what is more likely to be the reliable record of that meeting that happened in January, a near contemporaneous memorandum prepared in the absence of any political heat, or the wild claims of the Leader of the Opposition lately made in order to get himself off the hook, what do you think, Mr Deputy President, would be the more reliable evidence of what was said by Mr Benighton to Mr Latham and, more importantly, Mr Deputy President, of what was not said by Mr Benighton to Mr Latham? I believe we can trust Mr Benighton. He has no motive. He has, uh, his reputation for integrity is unimpeachable. He prepared the note at a time in which there was no political heat generated by this meeting whatsoever, and the note speaks for itself. I would trust Mr Benighton, Mr Deputy President, and I think most Australians would prefer his version of events to that of the Leader of the Opposition to get himself out of a political hole. Senator Evans. Thank you. Acting De Sorry, Mr Deputy President. Uh, it was a good lawyer's argument uh, produced yeah. by the previous senator, but like the, most of the government's argument, it was very selective in its use of the evidence. Uh, we had another example again today when uh, Senator Ferguson verbaled, verbaled Mr Latham by not correctly quoting from the transcript, not quoting the whole quote from the transcript of his interview on AM this morning. And that was used as a device by the minister, Senator Hill, in order to uh, make, launch a sort of preemptive strike. And he's very into preemptive uh, strike policies, but a preemptive strike on the debate that he knew he'd have to face today. Because, Mr. Deputy President, we finished this week, this fortnight of the parliamentary sittings, just as we began. 
embroiled in a debate about the government's abuse of the traditions of the public service, about its politicisation of the Australian public service. As uh, Mr Latham said yesterday, Mr Howard will use anything he can to try to hang on to power. Last week, it was uh, Commissioner K uh, Kelty, the head of the uh, Australian Federal Police. He was pressured and, uh, and uh, used as part of uh, a defence of a Prime Minister's uh, position in order to uh, uh, retract his honestly held opinions about the influence of, of uh, government policy on the risk to uh, Australians of terrorist attack. We went through that terrible uh, episode where Mr Keelty was uh, publicly humiliated and used by the government as part of its defence uh, because he had a view contrary to theirs and he was pressured uh, in a very, uh, very unfortunate way. Today, we've seen, uh, the last couple of days, we've seen the government again attempting to abuse public service processes, use uh, to hide behind public servants in order to launch an attack on Mr Latham. Now, I know they're scared of Mr Latham. I know they're terribly uh, off balance as a result of the way Mr Latham is going down in the, in the Australian public. They're concerned by the polling figures. I understand all that. And this week's exercise was about trying to grubby Mr Latham, trying to, trying to sort of mess him up a bit, trying to dirty him up a bit. And we've had false accusation after false accusation. First of all, the Prime Minister said, oh, and Mr Downer claimed, there had been no briefings. Well, when it became clear they had, they had Mr Howard went in, oh, well, he'd had briefings, but they weren't really by Foreign Affairs and Defence. Mr Latham makes it clear, well, they were actually by Office of Foreign, Officers of Foreign Affairs and Defence, puts that on the record. Oh, well, then the, then the government's claim is, but they weren't really briefings about Iraq. Well, yes, uh, then Mr, uh, Mr Latham makes it clear that R Iraq was discussed. Oh well, then it's uh, that the, the debate, the, the meeting, the uh, the briefings weren't enough about Iraq or enough on the on the issues that the government thinks Mr. Latham should have uh, had uh, information from the departments on before he uh, continued uh, and, inf and and announced the uh, the uh, Australian Labor Party's policy on the withdrawal of troops from Iraq. What absolute nonsense! Mr. Latham had two briefings. In addition to that. He had a range of advice provided to him about how best to implement long-standing Labor policy. He had advi advice from Mr Kevin Rudd, the Foreign Affairs spokesman, who uh, had visited Baghdad and had first-hand experience of the situation on the ground, the role of the troops in the Australian contingent and, uh, and the functions they're providing. And he had advice from myself, which went to the, the briefings I'd had uh, earlier in the year from Defence and the stuff that's on the public record in terms of the debate with General Cosgrove and others about the deployment of troops, the dates for their planned withdrawal, what their functions are, uh, their health issues, all of those things which have been, which have been examined and discussed at length at estimates in another, in other, uh, 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 and in earlier briefings during the, during the war period. Now he had, the, he had all that information. What we've seen, as I say, is a desperate attempt to try and, try and dirty up Mr Latham as, as the Prime Minister gets more and more desperate. And what they've done, of course, is then drag public servants into this, insist that public servants provide letters. The first day, in defence, the minister got a letter from the secretary. That wasn't good enough because it didn't really establish his case. So then they had to go back and get Mr Benighton to sign a personal letter that obviously had to address a whole range of issues that he was requested to address. Now, Mr Benighton's a good officer. I make no criticism of him. But what, we, what we've seen is the constant uh, politicisation of the public service, and defence has suffered very badly. Who can not forget the, the incident involving Paul Barrett, the former secretary, the misuse of intelligence over Timor and the DIO, the children overboard affair, Andrew Wilkie, and the, and the, and the concern by a lot of former defence chiefs and senior officers about the government's misuse of intelligence in, in, the, in its public statements leading up to its involvement in Iraq. We have seen defence constantly uh, misused, constantly politicised as part of this government's desperate attempt Senator to hang Evans, on to power. Your time it's not has good enough. Expired. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Faulkner be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Yeah. Mr Deputy President, uh, during question time on the 31st of March 2004, Senator Harrodin asked me a question in my capacity as the Minister representing the Attorney General concerning sexual harassment in the workplace and advertising. I undertook to provide further information in relation to certain advertisements and seek leave to incorporate an answer, a, a, an answer in Hansard. Uh, which has been provided to me. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted.